I never thought I would be a Souls gamer, but here I am, 50 tries and 3 hours into fighting Dark Eater Medir, this majestic beast and loyal good boy who never really did anything to deserve an undead unkindled, that's me, dying and coming back to life over and over and over again like some rabid nightmare, single-mindedly intent on claiming this victory against the only boss of Dark Souls 3 he hasn't yet killed. It's at this point that my mind has started to go numb, my muscle memory taking over every one minute run back to the boss arena, riding the elevator, climbing down the ladder, walking, 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 followed by the longest drop down into a pit to end up here. But damn if it's not fun dodging this guy, having studied and learned every one of his attacks and their counter, slipping up every now and then, but otherwise feeling the sense of flow that only comes out of such deep muscle memoried history of defeat. And finally, at long last, the moment arrives, and man did we sweat to earn it. The thing that Dark Souls really nails is that as head smashingly difficult as things become, it never, or at least rarely, feels unfair. When you lose, it's your fault, but losing just makes it all the sweeter when you, uh, what, what, what the what this, this game, man, I'm, I'm, I'm done with this shit. Gonna run up Bastard, I didn't know who you were. So you're probably wondering how I got here. I, I want to tackle this video from two angles. One, from the point of view of my relationship with gaming and how Souls games change that. And two, from the angle of existential and absurdist philosophy and how we struggle in the pursuit of things that give our lives meaning. We'll start with the lighter one. The first game I ever played was Final Fantasy VII. I remember my six-year-old eyes landing on my uncle's copy of this hefty multi-disc CD case with the front cover featuring this spiky blonde-haired dude wielding an awesome slab of a sword. I don't know if this was completely true, but I remember it as Final Fantasy VII being my first experience of immersing in a fictional world. In retrospect, FF7's art wasn't great even taking into account the hardware limitations of its time. They do this thing where for most of the game you're this blocky 3D Lego looking goofball plastered in front of mostly 2D backgrounds and it's just not very pretty in my opinion, but to my young mind in the 90s it was enough to activate my neurons and project in my mind's eye this incredible breathing world that began with Midgar and then eventually stretched out over three discs to this whole crazy planet with all these towns and caves and snowfields and sewers and the golden fucking saucer with its own recursive metaverse of games within the game. For me, a kid who barely knew what was in every room of his house, much less his town, the Magetta city in the Philippines, much less the world, it was overwhelming and exciting and energizing. From that early experience, exploration, consciously or otherwise, has been one of the reasons why I play games. A journey that no Earth people have ever undertaken before. Now whether you consider me a devil or a saint is unimportant. What is important is that you're here on this spaceship. And the characters, oh man, the characters. As a kid in a small town growing up with just a small group of friends, this feeling of building up your party as you traverse the world was just so rewarding. My lack of life experience meant that most of the dialogue, at least the dimensions that mattered, went right over my head, but it didn't matter. Cloud was cool, so it was cool pretending to be Cloud. Barrett and Tifa were my homies, Vincent was a badass, and Sid was iconic. Final Fantasy VII also instilled with me a love for the RPG genre, specifically turn-based RPGs. One of the best parts for me was the power fantasy of it specifically from the numbers getting higher when you bonk the bad guy every time you leveled up. I remember getting into the online guides and finding ways to break it, 
embedding your equipment with the right combination of materia so that you could break the game into letting you spam emerald weapon with a seemingly infinite chain of 9999 damage summons and then finally at last vanquish him. These were the things that I gravitated towards in the games I came to love later in life. Exploration, characters, and progression. As I grew up, a fourth element started to come into focus, and that was story. My favorite games would eventually be the ones that moved me somehow through their narrative, like Final Fantasy Tactics. It's the best Final Fantasy game in my opinion, on one hand because of how great its tactical combat system feels, on the other hand because of how fantastically written it is. I played Tactics again as an adult, and it strikes me as the best story in the series still. One that was unafraid to have real stakes, whether that was at the scale of a world at war or the more intimate scale of two childhood best friends whose paths have split beyond repair. In high school, my favorite game was Bioshock. I haven't played it since then, but I still remember vividly how the world looked and felt and the morbid fascination that came with picking up a new audio diary and hearing these citizens of Rapture take one more step from utopia to chaos. Bioshock's world and the story of its citizens were haunting, unsettling, yet mesmerizing. Not to mention that twist, I, I won't spoil it here because you really need to experience Bioshock's story for yourself if you haven't. But what I will say is that the way it uses the format and the structure you've learned subconsciously from a lifetime of gaming against you, all in service of this gut punch, is a marvel. First time I fell in love with gaming as a working adult was with Nier Automata, which built its greatest achievement off the same general trick, using the design of a video game against you, but in service of nailing an emotional point. Again, I won't spoil this one because you deserve to experience it yourself, but Nier Automata really hit that sweet spot for me, that cocktail of an alluring world and an endearing set of characters and a story that sinks itself into your soul. That one is for sure the subject of another video in the future. Everything that lives is designed to end. We are perpetually trapped in a never-ending spiral of life and death. Is this a curse? Or some kind of punishment? I often think about the god who blessed us with this cryptic puzzle, and wonder if we'll ever have the chance to kill him. I don't want to get too distracted here. My, it's, you know, it's easy to be sidetracked when geeking out about games that I love. My point is that I played games to scratch a particular itch, which had everything to do with experiencing a world and a story and the characters in it, and nothing to do with difficulty and mastery. I did mention progression earlier, but crucially I was talking about the progression of the player character, not necessarily the player. The numbers would go up, New moves would get unlocked, skill trees would synergize with each other, but as a real-life individual sitting a layer up on the matrix, I never felt the need to truly challenge myself. I was never the type to look for a hard mode. Even when I discovered and fell in love with roguelikes, a famously difficult genre, it was more the process of racking up new abilities and weapons and incremental buffs that kept me hooked, more so than my own improvement as a player beyond a baseline. So then why did I pick up Elden Ring? I mean, honestly, probably it was just the hype. Maybe a bit of my love for George R. R. Martin as one of the storytelling greats. There was a part of me that loved the world of Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire and the thought of stepping into that and being a part of his narrative and world building web rather than just watching or reading it was alluring. That was a bit of a red herring in retrospect. Elden Ring takes place 
hundreds of years after the lore that Martin wrote as a foundation of the world. But his fingerprints are still visible all over the environmental storytelling, so I was satisfied on that note. I loved Elden Ring almost right away, but not for the reason that I love it in the soul genre now. Those four elements that form the itch I like to scratch by playing games were all present here. The characters were intriguing, and even though our interactions with them are limited, I spent many a late night falling asleep to Vatividia videos so I could understand a bit deeper into the tragic lore of one NPC or the fallen heroism of demigods like Melania and Radan and how they clashed. I confess that I learned the story and characters more through YouTube than my own investigation, but it still felt special. And then there was the exploration. No other game I've played nails this sense of wonder as well as Elden Ring does. From the first moment you step out into the open world, seeing the glow of the Erd tree in the distance and wondering how the hell do I get there, chasing the horizon and never quite finding the path. Instead, I landed in the hellscape that is Caled and died screaming to enemies I wasn't ready for over and over again. And the way the world somehow just keeps getting bigger than you imagined. I remember stepping out on the other side of Stormville Castle and being astonished by that view of Lyurnia of the Lakes. I spent a good hour just riding around trying to see Lyurnia's every edge, enchanted by the nature of this strange sinking region, and of course there's that moment everyone remembers, when you go down that one particular elevator and it just keeps on descending and descending all the way down to this giant underworld with its own starry sky underneath the world you were just getting to know as if the surface wasn't already deceptively massive. Oh my god, is that a whole fucking city? <gasps> oh my god, it's beautiful! Holy shit! In terms of progression though, I admit now that I was too intimidated by the reputation of Dark Souls difficulty to really push myself. So I approached progression the way I was used to from other games through progression of the player character and their stats and abilities and equipment, trying to make the numbers go up by leveling up and upgrading weapons and collecting spirit ashes like I was playing Pokemon, before eventually settling on just upgrading and buffing my mimic tier as much as I could. There's nothing wrong with playing the game this way, and I loved every second of my first Elden Ring playthrough. I came to relish the experience of dying again and again to a boss, then eventually coming out victorious. There was nothing like it. But what I realized in retrospect is that I wasn't winning by vastly improving as a player. I won mostly through leveling up and taking advantage of openings when the boss was distracted by my summon. By the end of the game, I wouldn't be able to recognize the boss movesets and the proper response to them if my life depended on it. What actually got me to love the classic Souls experience, funnily enough, was not a FromSoft game, but FromSoft's greatest copycat, The Lies of P. I picked this up over a year after finishing Elden Ring and again I couldn't quite tell you why except that I saw a lot of YouTube videos praising it and I kind of liked the idea of playing as Timothy Chalamet in a quasi-Victorian steampunk setting so you know why not give it a try. I played through Lies of P at first in the same way I approached Elden Ring, through improvement in stats and weapons and using every tactical advantage I could. This time though, I decided to refrain from using summons so I could experience the dance with the boss's movesets a bit more cleanly. What ended up happening was I went for a different crutch, which was getting lucky enough on the RNG that I could get the boss to a low enough health that I could take them down to zero by just throwing every single consumable in my inventory. But the bosses of Liza P can be so tanky, such long endurance fights that you can't rely on just getting lucky all the time. 
so I started to experience these small snippets of flow where, despite my reluctance, I found myself internalizing a few moves by Scrapped Watchmen and Andreas and was able to perfect guard some of their combos by second nature. At the end of my first playthrough, I found myself really clicking with Nameless Puppet and having a lot of fun guarding against his moveset, sometimes perfectly, most of the time just enough to survive and eke out a victory. And when that last fight was done, I wanted more, so I went straight into New Game Plus, which I rarely do right away, and challenged myself to play it straight with minimal use of consumables this time. I wanted to level myself up not just my player character. And I remember the moment that I experienced that big crunchy click inside me. Some 20 tries into New Game Plus Luxacia where I could suddenly recognize and respond optimally to almost every move she threw my way. Perfect guard her big strikes, run away from her R1 spam combo, step to her left when she drags her sword across the ground. For the first time, I knew in my bones what people meant when they talked about the dance of fighting a boss in a Souls game. And I was hooked. And now I had a parry addiction, so the next rational step was to revisit from Soft Land and try my hand at Sekiro. Where demonic possession lives and evil penetrates the soul. Sekiro's combat came naturally to me after Liza P. I actually beat Genichiro fairly easily, the boss many describe as the first big roadblock in the game. I struggled more with the false corrupted monk for a reason that would become clearer to me in retrospect. His posture recovery was insane, and while I was decent at parrying, I wasn't being aggressive enough or taking enough risks to find windows to chip away at the boss's HP, which was linked to their posture recovery rate. So I would keep deflecting, get a hit in here and there, but then the monk's posture bar would recover faster than I could break it. I ended up getting through this fight by just cheesing the monk with firecrackers and fistfuls of ash. Our father taught me definitively that this was not enough. This was a boss with so much aggression and endurance that it wasn't enough to just keep deflecting his moveset. You had to take risks to experiment with where in his flurry of attacks you could land a hit and chip his HP, and in doing so lower his posture recovery. You couldn't just let the guy dictate the flow of the fight. You had to take control of it yourself. Sword Saint Ishin made sure that you took this lesson to heart and mastered it. Hesitation is defeat, he would say famously again and again and again every time you hesitated and let him land a hit or recover too much, which would inevitably lead to your death. By the time I beat Ishin, I had learned to not only deflect his moveset and take advantage of his openings, but also crucially to manage my own psyche. When you get hit, don't act like you got hit. Don't run away, but keep yourself in there, maintaining the rhythm, blocking and deflecting to keep the pressure on him. And if you need to heal, the best time to do it is not by running away, but by earning an opening to heal after countering one of his big moves. Do not, under any circumstances, hesitate, and eventually you will win. I love that Sekiro has a boss rush mode because after defeating Ishin, I played this fight over and over and over again so many times and the feeling you get when that boss that felt so daunting becomes not a walk in the park but just so fair and manageable and readable, that feeling is what makes me love Souls games and keeps me wanting more. More came in the form of Bloodborne next, and after all the confidence I had built up, I spent the first few hours of that game just dying again and again to mobs in central Yarnum. Bloodborne was the perfect next step for me because it rewarded my aggressive playstyle that Owl Father and Ishin taught me to embrace, and it led to some of my favorite moments in the series so far. When I learned to dance with Lady Maria by keeping close and dodging into her attacks, when Ludwig's second phase just clicked with me right away and I was able to stay right in his face, not needing to memorize his moveset but just reacting to the swing of his sword and then punishing with my own. Orphan of Cost taught me to mix up my R1s with strategically timed charged R2s from behind that would give me a chance to deal juicy backstab damage so necessary against his tanky health bar. 
and after that came Dark Souls 3, which after all these games felt like the most refined version of all the others, an almost perfect roster of bosses which culminated in one of my favorites, Slave Knight Gale. Gale is the best kind of boss, the type that is so fair and so readable yet still so deadly, which means every time you lose you know why you lost, and you're excited to jump right in again because you know there's no reason you can't overcome this. And that's where I am now. I've finished Liza P, Sekiro, Bloodborne, and Dark Souls 3, and I've replayed Elden Ring over the course of the past two months, now taking my time to save for Dark Souls 1 and the rest of the series after that. What else is there to talk about, right? Souls games made me embrace the struggle, forced me to stop worrying and love the get good, and level myself up, not just the abilities of my character. feels like such an elementary thing, but one that never clicked with me and something I never really looked for when I looked at games before this. And now I can't get enough of it. It's even seeped into other parts of my life. I don't think it's a coincidence that I've found motivating myself to do creative work to be easier. Not only that, but in the past month I decided to try learning music again after over 20 years and even started getting into sports for the first time in my life. I played paddle. I play paddle now, every week, poorly and I would never have imagined myself enjoying it. And that all started when I had this moment on the court where the ball hit the racket in just the right angle and timing, and it felt the way it feels when I land a perfect parry in Sekiro. Now, whenever I have to do something I'm not comfortable with, I think to myself, I'm a Dark Souls player, I just need to die a million times and I'll eventually get there. So let me end by zooming out a bit. I'm an introverted creative type with a fun little proclivity towards depression and anxiety which means that I'm in my head a lot, thinking about life and humanity and meaning. In my first year of college I took a philosophy class called The Meaning of Life where I learned about existentialism and absurdism. To put it simply, existentialism and absurdism are responses to nihilism, which is a realization that life likely has no inherent meaning. Modern life and science and knowledge has worn away at faith and spirituality, which were the things that distracted us from staring too deeply and directly into the void, this dreadful possibility that maybe there's no one behind all this, no easy set of rules, and we are just accidental clumps of atoms in a wild universe that has no greater purpose. Existentialism responds to this realization by saying, if there's no inherent meaning, then the only meaning that matters is the meaning that we create for ourselves. Absurdism takes us a step further. You can create whatever meaning you want, but how will you really know that even that holds value? If even the meaning you create for yourself can be worthless at the end of the day, then the only way to survive and keep your sanity is to embrace the absurd, embrace the struggle in itself, every detail of the journey, no matter the destination. This is where Albert Camus brings in the image of the tragic Greek Sisyphus, cursed to roll a boulder up a hill for eternity only to have it reach the peak and roll back down again and again. Camus writes, I leave Sisyphus at the foot of the mountain. One always finds one's burden again. But Sisyphus teaches the higher fidelity that negates the gods and raises rocks. He too concludes that all is well. The universe henceforth without a master seems to him neither sterile nor futile. Each atom of that stone each mineral flake of that night-filled mountain in itself forms a world. The struggle itself towards the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. What I love about Souls games is how they embody this idea not only in the gameplay but in almost every dimension. The most tragic characters in Souls games are those who are consumed by the pursuit for the promised ends rather than the struggle itself. 
I take Lawrence from Bloodborne, who ignites the frenzied fire of Yarnum's story when he, a young and ambitious scholar, decides to throw away his master's principles and use the power of the old eldritch blood for all its healing potential. What he achieves is the absolute defilement of the world around him, and for himself, eternal damnation as a raging cleric beast perpetually on fire in a literal hell, forever tortured by the consequences of an ambition he cannot let go of. And then there's Ludwig, a noble hunter who has internalized the creed of the healing church and takes it upon himself to act as its holy blade, cleaning the beasts of Yarnum from its streets. When we find him, he has become perhaps the ugliest beast of all, only reclaiming a sliver of his humanity in the second phase of his boss fight. He dies as what he hates, for he cannot shed his extrinsic principles, and his only happy ending comes from accepting a lie from the player that his church hunters are out there doing justice to his legacy. Tell me, good hunter of the church, have you seen the light? Are my church hunters the honorable Spartans? I hoped they would be. Good. That is a relief. To know I did not suffer such denigration for nothing. Thank you kindly. Now I may sleep in peace. And the last of the old hunters, Maria. Once a bright eyed pupil of the first hunter Gehrman, Maria takes her own life when she sees past the church's dogma and recognizes the horrific nature of the church's actions killing and defiling a god, damning an entire village to torture and inhuman experimentation. Of the three, she exits with perhaps the most dignity, pouring her every being into a battle against the player so she can at least die fighting excellently for a purpose she can believe in, one that she made for herself, defending the fishing hamlet and the corpse of Kos from others like her in the church. Should be left well alone. In contrast to the hunters, the winners of the Souls games, if there are any to speak of, are the ones who choose their own path and hold themselves to the journey, whatever it may bring, and despite the temptation of outside dogma trying to dictate what is right and what is wrong. In Sekiro, Wolf and Kuro decide to stand by the principles they shape for themselves, and even Ishin gets the ending he wants, being bested in battle by an excellent opponent. Which brings us to Uncle Gale. Gale was a slave knight destined to serve as nothing more than fodder in Lord Gwyn's battles, but one day he decided to carve his own path and escape into the painted world of Ariandel. There he found a new purpose with the help of the painter who needs the blood of the Dark Soul to use as pigment to paint a new world, a better one. Gale throws himself fully into this pursuit, and when we fight him it's at the literal end of the world where he spent an eternity killing and consuming souls of men so he can digest them as pigment for the painter's new world. He's even led us here so we can kill him, take the dark soul, and bring it back to the painter. His item description reads, Gale knew he was no champion, that the dark soul would likely ruin him, and that he had little hope of a safe return. So he leaves tracks for us, the unkindled which we follow into this final battle of all battles between two nobodies with no one watching and little more than a chance that this will lead to the outcome he desires. Like Sisyphus, one must imagine Slave Knight Gale happy, I guess, eating his thousandth pygmy soul with no guarantee that it will bring him the dark soul he needs. When the player cuts into him and he bleeds the dark soul and recognizes it, he's visibly surprised like he had given up any assurance that he would get there, and had surrendered himself to the joy of the pursuit. 
Nevertheless, Gale succeeds in his goals, and he gives birth to a new world with the help of the player and the painter, precisely because he has surrendered himself to the fact that he has no way of knowing what his journey will take him to, and all he can do is try. Souls games leave us with this message that this is perhaps how new worlds and possibilities are created, with bold dreams defined by the self amid a chaotic universe, paired with the sober knowledge that we may never get there, and all we may have at the end of the day is the experience of the pursuit and the struggle. I see. We are much alike. Then I will name this painting Ash. It will be a cold, dark, and very gentle place. And one day, it will make someone a goodly home. I wonder when Uncle Gale intends his return. I hope the new painting will be to him a gentle home. So here's to you, whatever struggle you're in, whatever boulder you're pushing up your own unforgiving hill. I wish you the best of luck in getting to your goals and short of that, that you enjoy just every bit of the struggle regardless. Hopefully it doesn't you know, like Gale involve having to endure eternity, killing and eating humans and pygmies for their souls, but hey, you do you, right? Just remember, don't go hollow. Thanks for listening, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I've really loved my journey with the Souls game so far and can't wait to share more of it with this community. Until then, have a good day and many more good days ahead. I'll see you around.